host, Judy Warner. Welcome back to this week's Ecosystem Podcast. I'm sort of pinching myself today because I can't believe who I get to introduce you to. This is one of my favorite podcasts so far, and I think you're going to love it. Today, I'm joined by Alex Lido, who is just the co-eventor of, you know, a couple little things like MOSFET and GAN technology. Oh, my goodness. What a great man this is. He's an inventor, a passionate scientist, and just a lovely human being that has really had an impact on our world through these technologies. He's going to take us on a journey that I know you're really going to enjoy and make sure you go get all his resources that he's loaded up for you in the show notes. And please come over and sign up to the double ecosystem.com for our newsletter. There's some free downloads for you and we're going to start add new things like a job board. We have an online community and so much more because you're what really makes up the ecosystem. Thank you so much. And now let's jump right into our conversation with Alex Lido of EPC. Hi, Alex. Thanks so much for joining today. I'm so excited to learn from you in this conversation. Thanks for having me. So first, before we get started, what is up with that? It looks like a Peterbilt truck behind you. I don't see that in a in a MOSFET Dan guy's office. What's that about? Well, it's just a reminder of what's coming at me every day. So <laughs> I just like to keep running faster and faster to stay ahead. I see. The speed of technology bearing down on you, I see. Yeah, well, and, and the force of a Peterbilt. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. So if you don't outrun it, you're going to get run over, right? Um, well, Alex, you know, it's so nice to meet you. You and I share a friend in common who is Steve Sandler, and I appreciate him introducing me to you and learning all about you as I've done a little research. For our audience's sake, can you please give an overview of who you are, your educational and professional background, and just sort of give us a snapshot and then just a, a thumbnail of EPC, your company. Okay, well, my name is Alex Lido, and um, I, uh, uh, I, I am CEO and co-founder of Efficient Power Conversion, and we make uh, gallium nitride devices to uh, make uh, energy efficiency, um, uh, improve energy efficiency. Uh, I got my undergraduate degree in 1975 from Caltech and my graduate degree, PhD from Stanford in 1977 uh, and uh, started at International Rectifier in 1977 and uh, my first project was to develop a better transistor and a colleague of mine from Stanford and I developed the early power MOSFETs. So no wonder you're out running that truck still at this age. So. <laughs> You know, it's still at this age. Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> but you can still outrun it. I'm impressed. So let's talk about that. The MOSFET. Like, what led you? You know, what led you to that place? And I know traditionally up to that time, um, it was a bipolar transistor. So, what drove the technology, and what drove your interest in in that field? So when I was a graduate student. Uh, uh, sort of just re fairly uh, soon before I graduated, uh, a, a colleague of mine who was a, a professor there, uh, he, he came down to my lab and we were just chatting about various things and he took off his glasses and he said, do you know what makes these glasses cost what they cost? And I said, I, you know, yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> and he said, well, what makes them cost what they cost is the buildup of energy it took to bring them to this state. Uh, hmm. And he said that, you know, the energy has uh, six elements to it. It has the, the cost of, of uh, generating the energy, distributing it, storing it, converting it, consuming it, and cleaning up after it. And he said that uh, that's the foundation of all of our global standard living. He said now geopolitics can change the price that we pay for those things. But the cost of those things is very fundamental to that. So if you want to improve the world standard living, improve the cost of energy yep. uh, and, and that set me on a lifelong uh, quest to improve energy efficiency uh, and uh, you know the MOSFET was frankly the thing that I could see at the time had the greatest opportunity uh, and in fact over time I think it's been proved to have saved about 30 percent of the world's energy so it's, it's quite a big big uh, savings. That's amazing so before we get too much further. I mean, almost everybody that will be listening or watching 
to this conversation is familiar with MOSFET. So can you unpack, first of all, the acronym? Because I didn't know it until you taught me. <laughs> and, um, and, and what that did going from, you know, what that did practically to the cost of energy. So MOSFET stands for Metal Oxide Semiconductor Field Effect Transistor. It's a long acronym. That's why we yeah. use the acronym. Um, and uh, it basically is a transistor that turns on and off uh, the flow of electrons or electricity. Uh, and it, it uh, does it at a very high speed. And that's the key. Because before that, there were things like thyristors and bipolar transistors. And those were the switches that we used to modulate current on and off. Mm -hmm. um, now, in the 70s, um, there was a, uh, I'll say, a push towards a different kind of power conversion, uh, switching power conversion, as opposed to linear power conversion. Mm -hmm. And in switching power conversion, you basically chop the current and voltage into small chunks of energy uh, and then reassemble them after like a transformer or an adductor into the form that you want, usually going mm -hmm. from a high voltage to a low voltage would be the most common form. Um, and if you do that in a, in a very, um, I'll say, slow device, like a thyristor or a bipolar transistor, um, you, you tend to have a lot of waste. Uh, and the analog I use is, is if you had a, a small cup of water and you wanted to fill it from a fire hydrant, you know, you have this big valve, you turn the valve on, you, the water comes out, turn the valve off, you, the glass is full, but you got water all over the street. Right. Well, that's what happens with a slow switch, uh, and um, with a fast switch, you can actually chop that water into individual droplets without mm. impeding the flow and fill up the glass and stop. Uh, and so that, that was something that needed to have a much faster transistor to be practical, uh, and that was the key motivation behind developing a power MOSFET, which was, you know, 100 times faster than the bipolar transistors of the era. Mm. Uh, and and that, that started that trend uh, towards switching power conversion, both for power supplies and motor drives. Uh, and, and that's where the savings came from. I see. Okay, well, that's a good, that works for me, the, the picture of the fire hose. Um, so, again, I mentioned it at the top that we were introduced by Steve Sandler. And when he told me about you and, and your relationship over the years together. He said early on you sent him some MOSFETs and he stomped around like an impetuous child and said, Alex, it'll never work. He goes, turns out I was right just 40 years later. <laughs> 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 so he's a, he's a prophet in his own mind. So, um, but let's talk about obviously for 40 years, MOSFETs have served you know, the world really in a really um, impactful way. So where are we today? From the 70s so, till now, where are we today with MOSFETs? So M MOSFETs, by the way, spawned a derivative called the IGBT, which is really a combination of MOSFET and bipolar transistor. And, and, and between the two of them, they created, you know, tens of billions of dollars of marketplace. But mm. right around the turn of the millennium, um, it, it really became evident that, that MOSFETs uh, had hit their theoretical limit. Mm. Uh, there's something called the Beliga curve that tells you exactly how much you could get theoretically out of a transistor. Uh, and um, we knew that we were at that limit. Now, when we started, the very first MOSFETs were 400x away from that theoretical limit. Right. So over a period of about 22 years, we made this journey of improvement and improvement and improvement. Um, but once you hit a limit with a device, uh, a lot of people say, well, but those limits, you know. But this in a power device was pretty fundamental. Mm -hmm. uh, so you really have to think about something radically different to do. And in the case of power devices, that really meant a different material. Um, and it was right around that time that I, I read about some work done in Japan growing um, uh, device grade gallium nitride on top of standard silicon wafers and this hmm. this became a, a sort of a light bulb moment i said well if you can just put a micron of gallium nitride on top of a standard silicon wafer you could probably process that in a standard silicon factory and if you can do that then you've got something that is potentially thousands of times better than silicon um, with without a whole lot of cost penalty uh, and I think, you know, turns out 
23, later, 23 years later, we, we kind of are, are demonstrating that that's true. Right. So what does that limit look like? Is it just a, a speed of signal? Is it a capacity? Is it both? And, and then how did you pivot at that point and start moving towards GAN technology? Uh, so first of all, that limit is uh, the resistance of the device uh, for a given area and a given voltage that you want to block. Okay. Mm -hmm. So on, if you think about this graph, it's usually the vertical axis is the resistance of a one square millimeter device, and on the horizontal axis it says voltage. And there are all these uh, diagonal lines for different materials, and mm -hmm. silicon's diagonal line, which you can buy devices all along that diagonal line, is actually 6,000 times higher than the diagonal line for gallium nitride. About, wow. It's about 1,000 times higher than the diagonal line for silicon carbide, for example. Uh, so, you know, that was, uh, I knew that. I knew that from my graduate yeah. school days. It just, there was no way to really make good gallium nitride economically in those days. So this thing about putting it on top of silicon was really crucial. Now, at the time, I was CEO of International Rectifier. And mm -hmm. we were the largest producer of MOSFETs in the world. Uh, and uh, so I realized that I'd better do something. Because when something hits a fundamental theoretical limit, um, the fun is out of it. <laughs> you know, it's all, right. uh, there's no more fun, right? It's right. just who has the most money to build the biggest factories and is right. willing to take the most pain. Then the commodity uh, thing happens and then it, yeah, all the innovation yeah, stops. It's, it's no and, fun. You know, look, I like to invent things. Uh, you know, I was always interested in technology. So, so we started working on it at uh, International Rectifier um, and um, actually bought a small company called Ganrose and uh, started, I'll say, tinkering in the early days with it. Well, the, the good news is um, I got fired from International <laughs> Rectifier. And what? You. Yeah. So, um, you know, there, there, so now I'm all of a sudden kind of loose ends. What the heck do I do with myself? Um, and, I, you know, I still had ringing in my ears that thing about energy. Uh, so I thought yeah. of a couple of things. And I remember standing in the shower thinking, I, there are two things I can do. There are two things that I want to do. One of them is I want to create a carbon exchange because I believe that a carbon exchange is the best way to deal with global warming. Because uh, we the all stand was, around in the shower and contemplate these things, Alex. You're so funny. Especially when you've just been fired. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then the second thing was gallium nitride. And I thought to myself as the shampoo was running down my face into my eyes, <laughs> that maybe I better do gallium nitride because I know how to do that a little bit better. And yeah. so I started a company uh, called um, Efficient Power Conversion uh, with a couple of co-founders. One of them was the guy whose company I bought uh, a few years earlier, Bob Beach is his name, and another one is a, a fellow that I hired right out of uh, graduate school um, named Joe Cow. And uh, the three of us, and they were still working at International Rectifier, so they really took a, um, a leap since they were in good standing there, and I wasn't. Yeah. They took a leap of faith, and, uh, and we started Efficient Power Conversion on the thesis that we could make power devices that were both more efficient and lower cost than silicon, um, and realize that the two of those together was something that had never been done before. Uh, nobody had ever dared compete on a cost basis with silicon. You know, that's just like crazy right. stuff. Crazy. Uh, and, uh, and, but we succeeded at that. We, we, we can build uh, GAN devices now at a lower cost than silicon. Uh, and, and then the second part of that was that we would then use the uh, knowledge of the markets that we get with uh, uh, discrete devices mm -hmm. in order to develop integrated circuits. And the reason mm. for that is that we understood that with gallium nitride, it was easier to make power integrated circuits than in silica. So oh, you had an advantage with GAN, and then you had another advantage with integrating GAN. Uh, so that became our long, long range, uh, you know, trajectory. Uh, and we've been following that. Well, in my career, I remember a while back, I was, um, just because I've been around the block and I remember when everyone started talking about GAN 
And it was like, Gan, Gan, it's, it's going to take over the world, you know? So, but it's been, um, one thing Steve had mentioned to me, you know, as a fellow historian of power devices, he said, when MOSFET hit the market, it was instantaneous. Like the, the industry adoption, he said, was at breakneck speed. And, and he made a point that, GAN hasn't enjoyed that same, you know, vertical industry-wide adoption. So where are we today in regards to MOSFET GAN? Like now in 2023, where are we in that journey? So, you know, in, in most new technologies, there's sort of a crossing the chasm moment. Mm, there's something mm-hmm. that, that takes off that that gives you the volume that, that you need to crank down your costs and then, you know, it's self-reinforcing from there. Right. Um, in the, the MOSFET, it, it wasn't quite as <laughs> vertical as Steve. Uh, <laughs> That's how he remembers I, it. <laughs> yeah, well, good good, good for Steve because I, I sort of live that and, uh, you know, every day it was, why is this darn thing so slow? But there was a, a very big crossing the chasm moment. Mm, okay. Um, and, and that occurred around 1980 where when IBM uh decided to come out with a pc um Mm. and um now before that there was already a pc out in the market if you remember it the apple ie right i I remember getting a call from a guy named steve uh not sandler (laughs) it was one of the two steves it was steve wozniak who wanted to use uh, who wanted to include the power supply for the computer inside the computer so the whole thing would be self-contained on your desk and mm-hmm. uh, he needed a MOSFET to do that. And uh, we had developed uh, an app note about converting from AC to DC, a universal power supply. Mm. Uh, we had a very talented apps engineer who was, you know, sort of a godfather of all topologies. His name was Brian Pelly. Um, and um, and he, he thought that would be a great thing to incorporate. He did. That was relatively low volume. But the minute that IBM hit the market, it, it really was high volume. Uh, so mm-hmm. now we had kind of a volume application that was helping us cross the chasm. We could build a small factory, then we built a big factory, and then it cost it down even more, and then, you know, it self-reinforces. So the question is, what about GAN? Yeah. Well, um, we introduced the first production uh, version of GAN in March of 2010, and about three months later, um, a gentleman by the name of Dave Hall, a very brilliant guy, founder of Velodyne, um, Velodyne uh, Corporation. And he said, you know, I think that GAN would be a good thing for a 3D sensor. Uh, mm. And he wanted to build a 3D sensor for a Google, Google mapping function. Google Maps at Goodness. the time had a GPS and a camera yes. spinning around. I like remember that. when GPS hit. Yeah. And, and so this is, you know, this is like 20, 2010, late, late uh-huh. 2010. And uh, so he, he um, and, and he said that if, if, uh, if we can increase the speed that we can fire lasers by an order of magnitude, mm. then we can create a long distance um, sensor that has very high resolution and will be much better than radar. That was his thesis. Wow. And that's where, where really the, the first, um, you know, commercial LIDAR uh, sensors came from was Dave Hall and Velodyne. And they used our GAN devices. Now, that evolved into, you know, thousands of 3D sensing applications. And they all use GAN devices. Pretty much all of them do. Uh, and so that created a volume base that we could mm. grow on and also learning base that we could improve our devices. We then got a, a, a vehicle company to put our stuff on into headlamps, uh, yeah. and then we started to get um, higher volume applications in um, in, th- in things like power supplies for servers, uh, and power supplies yeah. for servers became a another step function bigger business, and then now solar has adopted GAN in a big way, so we have another step function with solar. Uh, in addition to all that, in parallel, um, our gallium nitride devices turned out to be extremely radiation hard, uh, not by coincidence, but by design. Well, okay, I was and like, so space wait. Space applications started taking off. Yep. So, oh, goodness. Space stuff. 
And, you know, in parallel with that, then we all, all want to do these last mile e-bikes, e-scooters and stuff like that. And we developed a bunch of ICs for that and those start taking off. So there's a bunch of these applications as people become more familiar with GAN that, that are very high volume that are kicking in right now. So do you think that and MOSFETs still fit for a myriad of applications, but now you're opening the doors to all these like space and LIDAR and all these advanced technologies that have taken off. So that's really interesting. So both have their place is what I hear you saying, but GAN is really opening doors. Well, so I'd say both have their place, but one is in the morgue. Uh, <laughs> um, okay. Well, that's interesting because, okay. <laughs> what no, is your you know, sale? So like, what to... is the adoption, though? Industry adoption for both? That's what I want to ask you. Being the yeah, devil's advocate it, here. It is a fair question, and I'm exaggerating only slightly. Uh, <laughs> so, back in the early days, again, back in the MOSFET, you know, the competition was the bipolar transistor. And mm -hmm. if you look at it today, 40 years later, the bipolar transistor still exists. And as a matter of fact, the size of the bipolar market is, is about the same as it was then. Um, but what happened was all the new applications went to MOSFETs mm. uh, and IGBTs. So the growth came from that. And of course, there's a lot of growth in our industry over these years. Yep, now, if you bet. look at what's happening with GAN is GAN is starting to, to attract uh, or is starting to um, secure the uh, a very high fraction, maybe even now a majority of brand new sockets. Uh, when mm. somebody upgrades from something, they are more inclined to do with GAN than with another MOSFET. Uh, that is most true in higher performance applications or applications where you need very small size or very lightweight or some very high speed for some reason. Mm -hmm. um, but it's occurring more and more frequently. And so, so the, the growth curve of, of GAN is going to be very high and the growth curve of MOSFETs is starting to roll over and will flatten out. I see. So when you talk about socketing, does that help in that you're not respinning a board or that's just a good way to adopt? Like, what is that socketing piece about? Well, so when I say a new socket, so let's say you're a power supply designer mm -hmm. um, and you um, are designing a power supply for a server. Mm -hmm. uh, good application, right? Now, server architecture used to be predominantly... Uh, an AC input, and you'd have an AC power supply that lives in your rack, and then you'd have a DC output, which is 48 volts, and then you'd have a 48 volt to 12 volt uh, converter, usually um, in the rack at each mm -hmm. of the uh, uh, each of the racks uh, individual slots, but on the others on the rack side of the the equation, um, and then on the the server board, you'd have point load converters that take 12 volts down to 3.3, 2.5, 1 1.8, uh, and stuff. Well, in the last few years, particularly at the high end, starting with AI, cloud servers, gaming machines, things like that, they found that the amount of current it took to power the GPUs, the graphic uh, processing, processing units, uh, mm -hmm. was much higher than the CPUs that they were using in prior generations. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the boards were becoming more and more uh, power consumptive. So it went from like a 500 watt uh, server board then to a one kilowatt, then to a two kilowatt, then to a five kilowatt, and then to, you know, on and on and on and on. Um, and uh, that that became a problem. So they started bringing the 48 volts onto the server. And uh, the minute you do that, you go from, you know, uh, very inexpensive real estate on a server rack to very expensive server real estate on a, on a board. And so it. there's a huge premium paid for power density. Now, if you just compare what's happened here, um, you know, this is uh, actually, this is a GAN device. I'll show you a GAN um, power supply for servers. This okay. is a thousand watt device right here. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, silicon, this was about 330 watts. So now GAN gets you up to a thousand watts like this. Mm. But now in the new generation of servers, uh, of, of power supplies, this is a thousand watts. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So it's easy to see. Up, yeah, you can see it's how like thirty percent thirty percent expensive real estate differential there. Yeah. So Yeah, I mean it's like it's it's almost less than four times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So, and of course, your efficiency is higher as well, so you gain there. But this is, is perfect for a server board because it doesn't take up a lot of space, has a lot of power density. Got it. So that just gives you an idea of the evolution. Now, you can't do any of that with a MOSFET. Right? So, you know, right. a, on a MOSFET, you better put it on the rack uh, instead of on the board because it just it doesn't fit. I see. Uh, so that, that those as those servers convert to 48 volts, now cars are converting to 48 volts. I don't know if you just saw, you know, for example, the Cybertruck. Uh, it was a big announcement. Cybertruck's going to be 48 volts. There are a lot of 48-volt cars out there, by the way. Um and uh, the minute you have a 48 volt system, uh, by far your best choice is GAN because GAN is also lower cost to produce on a component basis. Plus you have a much, much smaller, more efficient system out of it. So we're seeing car systems convert to GAN based 48 volts. Uh, we're seeing, um, you know, as new car platforms come out, not as the old cars. You're not gonna convert, you know, 1967 Chevy to 48 volts. But your brand new, you know, Porsche Cayennes and your Cyber Trucks and your, yeah. you know, all the mild hybrids are all coming out 48 volts. Uh, so that's a an, a an example where something that used to be a MOSFET, um, you know, realm at 12 volts in the car now is a 48 volt GAN thing, uh, and uh, it's it's becoming this big business. So. What I hear you say is you, uh, you know, one you love from your shower moment is you created a blue ocean, right? You got out of the the highly competitive MOSFET business and you said, I mean, it's such a blue ocean to say I can make it better and faster and cheaper. Like whoever gets to do that. And, um, and it's interesting. I saw Elon Musk not long ago talk. He was unveiling their, their, um, robots and he was saying well our cars are are already robots people just don't realize it you know yeah. and again the the compute speed on all of that is you know our, our minds don't get wrapped around that but i think it's it's really a truism so interesting by the way you mentioned that because all the humanoid robots use our gan devices um, of course they do and, and and yeah. now, now AI, machine learning, like seems to me, Alex, you're all in that's a, the GAN based, uh, based right. Stuff. It that you know, all all that new stuff is is where GAN is dominant, uh, and and silicon can't touch it anymore. It's really interesting. Um, I don't know, a month or so ago, a month and a half ago, I was podcasting from DesignCon, where Steve was nominated, by the way, Engineer of the Year. I remember, yeah. That, um, <laughs> but I. Engineer. I know. So, yeah. you know, we're rubbing elbows with the, with the man. <laughs> Anyways, he, um, I got to interview just actually a moment of, of, it was just fun and I was in the right place, right time, but I got to interview one of the, um, lead electrical engineers from Boston Dynamics. And he talked a lot about their, um, distributed power systems. Like it was power, power, power. Um, and so I'm sure you're in, like you said, in all those technologies. So when you introduce GAN, though, you know, I call my my podcast The Ecosystem with two E's because what I'm noticing that kind of high level, very, very high level is, you know, we used to get in these little well-guarded silos with our IP and all of that. But if we're not working together, nothing, we can't build anything. Um, so there has to be this ecosystem. So when you brought on GAN, was the ecosystem in place to support that technology? Like I'm thinking material science, you know, all, all the things that need to come together. Was that an issue for you at that time? Um, so, so I'd say that there are two things that pace GAN's um, adoption. One is ecosystem and the other one is uh, engineers that are experienced working with high speed components because mm, you know now mm -hmm. we're, we're going to a whole different level of speed yeah um and and so those two things really pace it uh in the early days 2010 uh, of course the ecosystem was much much more primitive when i say ecosystem gan switches you know 10 to 100 times faster than mosfets so there weren't drivers for that um there oh, weren't controllers for that there wasn't magnetics that could handle that 
Um, so the good news was that you know a la firing a laser requires no mag or very limited magnetics and very limited ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So that became the ideal cross the chasm kind of thing. And then we were able to motivate National Semiconductor, which became TI, to develop a driver for us. Uh, oh, and great. they did. It's an excellent driver, and and you know it's uh, it and it's you know it's uh, uh, progeny are still out there and very very popular. And many people make that now. Um, and then the the issue became controllers because now that you have a very high speed device, controllers couldn't keep up with it. And we're still fighting that battle of getting enough uh, ubiquity in controllers that any function that you want to do, you can do with with a GAN device. For example, motor drives, we have now, you know, use, say three years ago, it was only microchip. Now you have TI, you have Vernessis, you have ST, uh, you have on semiconductor. They all make controllers that work well with, with GAN in motor drive functions. Mm -hmm. um, so from your seat in the house, at the front of the, at the, front of the pack here, so to speak, um, how are researchers and engineers, and particularly, you know, we've talked about different technologies. And so are there any like obstacles in their path besides these ecosystem pieces? Like, because I come from the board, I'm thinking, yeah, what'd that do to the board design? Does it build up heat? Like, I'm just thinking about the, is, does that introduce new problems for engineers specifically, but also researchers? No, it, it certainly does. You know, you've got to sharpen up your skills a lot. Um, the analogy I use there is if you'd been your whole life driving a stick shift VW bug and somebody gave you a Ferrari and said you had to drive it as fast as possible, uh, you'd probably crash. Uh, and, you know, GAN devices are, are, are very high speed devices. Uh, and so people using their sort of low frequency techniques uh, very often get into trouble with that. And um, so there's a lot of education involved uh, and there's a learning curve. And I think that that was, it was certainly more than I expected. Um, and we put in a whole infrastructure to, to try to support that. As a matter of fact, we wrote textbooks that are used in universities uh, to help with that. Um, but uh, so, so that is hard. Now you mentioned PC boards and I know you have a specific background in PC boards. That was another challenge <laughs> because yeah. all of a sudden you have these, these devices that are 10 times smaller than MOSFETs. Um, so if your PC board doesn't have a higher resolution of traces, yeah. um, you can't really take much advantage of that. That's uh, right. So, you know, now all of a sudden, you know, you needed two ounce copper on 200 micron pitches and very few PCB manufacturers could do that. Uh, now a whole lot more can. Um, so, you know, that, that evolved. Uh, people who, who were familiar with making cell phones never had problems. But people who were familiar with making motor drives and power supplies, well, that, that became a high hurdle because none of their supply chain supported it. Well, I think about is, could that also be, um, you know, as people kind of hit that wall and, and it's like, I don't want to get in that Ferrari. It's scary. I know how to, I go just drive yeah. my VW faster. Does that happen? I mean, does that affect the adoption or the willingness to try to give? Cause you know, we all get in our lane and we want to stay where we know how to do things. Yeah, but, but more and more of those people driving the VW are left in the dust. Yeah, so like that truck. Happens. They get run over by that truck, right? <laughs> it's true. And, you know, look, uh, one piece of advice I'd give to any student uh, in uh, interested in this field is, you know, get into either GAN or silicon carbide. Don't waste your time with silicon uh, because there's plenty of support for silicon engineering and there's not much for GAN and, and silicon carbide. And that's where the future is. And I also say as sure as the sun comes up, um, GAN will replace MOSFETs below 650 volts. And as sure as the sun comes up, silicon carbide will replace silicon above 650 volts. The only variables are when it happens and who's going to benefit. Yeah. It's like start running or get run over by the truck. Um, while I was with Altium and I was um, engaged with not only um, 
board layout engineers, but I dealt with universities and I dealt with an organization specifically that was trying to bridge the gaps between what's taught at university and what happens in the real world. And I'm like, you guys aren't missing, you're, you're educating to research dollars, not what your day to day job is going to be. And I know that you sit on the board at Caltech now, and I'm sure you see this and, and are an advocate and it's, it's a tricky problem to solve. But, um, I saw a presentation by Northrop Grumman and saying, Hey, when you come on, we want you to be able to understand all this whole ecosystem and plus be able to do a good PowerPoint. And so it's, it's, designing some chips, designing some boards, and most EEs think they're going to go design chips and maybe on silicon. And they don't think they're ever going to touch boards again, you know, again, or, you know, and, and it, and then they jump into the workplace. And the, the students I notice that get the most uptake is the ones that jump on these really um, amazing engineering teams because it throws them into the deep end of the ocean <clears throat> what do you see, you know, like I said, you're on the board. So how do you speak into that demographic, especially being on the board? I mean, what's your thoughts there? Because I think it's a really important point as we look forward. Well, first of all, I rolled off the board of Caltech after 25 years. So oh, you that, did. But okay. Just a couple of months ago. So I'm still familiar with the story. It's, um, but Caltech is certainly a leading edge research institute. Um, but you look yeah. at schools like Virginia Tech, uh, University of Texas at Austin, UC San Diego, UC Irvine, they all have very, very uh, vital programs in power management. Uh, University of Wisconsin, University of Waterloo, Waterloo um, IIT in, in uh, Mumbai. And they, they crank out some very practically uh, you know, uh, fluent uh, engineers, some very impressive engineers. Uh, mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, just yesterday we had a PhD out of UCLA start here, uh, and he's he's you know he knows all this stuff. That's uh, great so, news. Uh, yeah, so I, I think we do have those education institutions. They may just not be the ones that specialize in in you know sort of very very advanced research. I see. Um, so in that case, you see that the ones that are heavy in research, because on the board, laying out a board, that is, seems like, ugh, I'm never going to touch that. But then they end up having to touch it because you have to cross the chasm between, you know, it's the board effects that'll kill you. You're making these great well, things. Yeah, it's, it's even more than that. When you get to this, yeah, everything interacts. Yeah. Um, so this, the black thing is actually a transformer, and you see it's kind of integrated into the assembly. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the, the very specifics of the magnetic field in that transformer is very crucial to the proper operation. So you can no longer be a PC board person. You have to understand thermals. You have to understand the, the signal paths. You have to understand the magnetics and the capacitors, all that stuff together. It's a very, very difficult job uh, today. Yes, it is. And how to, you know, the older generation is sort of the old drafters that became really good board layout guys are, and then these kids are coming up out of university and I'm like, oh, how do I help them know what's going on at the board level and that everything is radiating and that we're putting all this power and they all become, you know, Steve's taught me, they all become little antennas. <laughs> it's not really good. Exactly. Um, and now there's all sorts of software for simulating it all. And you can't yeah. just simulate it from a signal point of view, you have to simulate it from an EMI point of view and from a thermal point of view and a thermal mechanical point of view, um, you know, and, and all these things that, you know, we just were talking yesterday with a customer where we were doing all sorts of thermal mechanical modeling on, uh, you know, a, a power supply very similar to this mm -hmm. um, to, to make sure that it all kind of squeezed and fit and torqued together. Yeah. Well, one of our sponsors for the podcast is Keysight. And one of the things I love about them is that they can do that end to end. Right. And yeah. they can see they can see the part and they can see the overall and they do it at the ED, EDA level and the measurement. So it's a cohesive whole. And so they've been a good partner to help sort of deliver that message. And also, of course, they're saying, here's our tools. Um, so, yeah, I mean, they're, they're a fantastic uh, instrumentation mm -hmm. company and, and also now yeah. they make really good software. Yeah, their software is really impressive. So. 
You know, I always like to tease out, if I can, Alex, some case studies. Um, are there, can you discuss any um, current initiatives that you've been involved in at EPC and um, specifically re related to, you know, victories or failures around MOSFET and GAN? Yeah, I mean, I, there's some things that are, are interesting revolutions. Uh, and I, I think GAN pay, plays a big role in the revolution itself. Um, so, for example, it, it, just take motors. Uh, brushless DC motors replaced brush DC motors many years ago. And so we're all used to these three-phase brushless DC motors. You have them in your washing machines. You have them in uh, you know, e-bikes. You have them in drones. You have them in everywhere. You have them in motor, you know, in your uh, power tools. Um, and we got used to them. Um, so, and they all run at 20 kilohertz. So there's controllers, there's MOSFETs, there's all sorts of things. There are little, you know, multi-chip modules for all that kind of thing. Well, it turns out that, um, we all got sort of, uh, myopic about that. And as a result, uh, we, we missed a huge opportunity. So for example, if you go to higher frequencies, let's say hundred kilohertz, all of a sudden, the dynamics get much different. Um, the, the motor can deliver a whole lot more, or the, the motor control can deliver a whole lot more power to the shaft. There's a lot lost mm, in the shaft mm -hmm. because of that low frequency. Um, there's a sixth harmonic that, that gets you. That also makes a lot of audible noise. Um, and now the entire system can shrink enormously. Uh, into just a tiny little thing. I'll show you one of these. This is a this is a, a drive system for an e-bike. See those three things? Those yep. are three ICs of in GAN. And those three plus a controller make an entire e-bike system, motor drive system. Mm -hmm. um, so by going to higher frequencies, you get an order of magnitude uh, shrinkage, but you also get rid of the most gnarly component, which is an, an electrolytic capacitor. You can get rid of your mm -hmm. electrolytic capacitor. So now all of a sudden things start unwinding in terms of cost and reliability. Everything going I see. You know, in the right direction. Yeah. Um, and because it's so small, it's real easy to shield it so the EMI problems go away. So um, there are these, these uh, I won't call them mini revolutions because there's you know a few hundred million hand tool, power hand tools that are battery <laughs> operated. Uh, they're made every year. And that is a big market that is converting to GAN. Um, there are bunches of electric bikes. Uh, although it's a new market, there are still millions of them, and those are all going to e-bikes. And then scooters, same thing. Um, and it's they're all taking advantage of, of both a higher frequency capability, smaller size, and lower noise. And that's just one example. It takes a few years for all those companies to get through their design cycles and you know yeah, it does. Uh, obsolete their old design and all that kind of stuff. But that's happening. And for the it market. Yeah, well, and those markets to mature, as you said. I have, my husband and I have two amazing e-bikes. I love those things. And I it's love, amazing. I love mine, that's for sure. <laughs> I love mine. And um, it's like around where I live here. Well, you and I talked about it. I'm in the Temecula area. It's hilly. So to have a pedal bike in your 60s is not that fun. <laughs> it's like I want to power up to get up that hill and... You know, and it makes for like I could write hours now. And but what amazes me because I have been electronics is the it's not a big bulky thing, right? That that motor is yeah. just in the back rim and battery's a little bulky, at least in mine. But um, it's just it's pretty miraculous, right? And we just hop on and ride them and whatever. But it's the footprint's pretty amazing. So that size piece is no small yeah. thing. Um, yeah, I have the same thing. I live in a hilly area, and, and uh, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't do it otherwise. It's fantastic. Right? Yeah, I, I tried. <laughs> I almost gave myself a heart too. attack. <laughs> and and uh, I have a fancy bike to prove it <laughs> that I don't Yeah, use. <laughs> exactly. I know. And uh, we haven't tried it yet, but we keep saying we're going to go ride wine country up Rancho, and I'm like. I don't know if that's very smart unless we have an Uber pick us up at the end, but, <laughs> or maybe you go to one winery. I don't know. Um, so any thoughts on, I think we've covered a lot. So um, 
by the way, for our audience, I want to hop in here. And Alex, I mean, there the EPC website is an absolute gold mine. There's there's books, there's resources. It is an absolute gold mine. And so I'm going to put the link to that in the show notes, but make sure you go check out EPC. It's EPC.com. EPC-CO.com. There you go. So please go over and check it out. There's, you know, you can learn so much more than we've had the time to talk about, but you can get amazing resources, learn so, so much. And so Alex, um, where else would you recommend that our listeners go learn about adoption, what's available, maybe if they haven't been paying explicit attention to maybe making the swap? So, you know, I, 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 it, it's maybe a little self-serving, but I'd probably start with the textbooks that are available. And, you know, the, the, this one from, it, this is actually a peer-reviewed textbook by John Wiley. So it's mm-hmm. not a commercial thing. But GAN transistors for efficient power conversion, uh, you know, gives you both the background in, in, you know, how GAN works as a, as a semiconductor. And then it also proceeds to tell you about, uh, about applications. Now, Wiley publishes these, this is third edition, and Wiley publishes these on five-year centers. So we're going to do a, a fourth edition probably in about three more years because that came out two years ago. But mm-hmm. that's a problem because the technology is moving much faster than that. So we publish an intermediate version, which is GAN Power Devices and Applications, mm-hmm. that um, it, it was basically everything since that book published. So after two years, we I published see. this. And not only that, but we put QR codes at the beginning of every chapter. So if you click on the QR code, you can actually get an update to the minute. Um, oh, goodness. So we're, That's we're, great. We're, yeah, we're trying to, to have a, I'll say, um, you know, a, a reference library that actually keeps pace with technology development. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that those QR codes are updated practically daily. Um, and and we found that universities are adopting these books. Uh, so we have a lot of students that, that use them in classes and stuff like that. Uh, and, and I think that if you want to have a, a general education, that's what they were designed for. Mm-hmm. Uh, a general education in the advanced, uh, you know, power conversion technologies, specifically using GAN. And I noticed on your website too, you have a forum, right, where engineers can talk to other engineers, yeah. or probably some of your subject matter experts. Yeah, yeah, we we we're all over that. Uh, it's a fun place. There's some some fun controversies. <laughs> <laughs> Go As on there in always there. are <laughs> in engineering, you guys fight amongst yourselves. Like I try to be like, I'm Switzerland and stay in the middle. Well, this has been so valuable. And Alex, I really thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule and teaching us all about the history of the applications. I think this is really insightful and our audience is really going to enjoy it. So I appreciate your time. Thanks very much, Judy. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, you know, anytime. <laughs> I could talk about this all day. I know. Well, it's fun for me, too, because I love learning. Well, um, I'll, I'll say farewell now. And for our audience, please go over. I don't care if you're working out or driving your car. Take time to go over to um, the description in the show notes and go to those links. There's really rich resources for you there. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you've enjoyed this conversation with myself and Alex Lido. We'll see you next time. Until then, remember to always stay connected to the ecosystem. Oh, 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 oh,